The first module of the day is on adaptive interventions, which all of you know all about because you looked at the video. Billy's going to give you a little, a little review. OK, so what we're going to do now is indeed have a little review. And it means that I'm going to try and talk less and let you do the talking, OK? But before I let you do the talking, I want to make sure that we're on the same page in terms of defining adaptive interventions. Then I'm going to show you an example that I know you're all familiar with, just so that we can go over the components of an adaptive intervention again to make sure that we're all on the same page. And then we're going to go to the fun part, where we're going to have a Q&A session with Kahoot. And the goal of the Q&A session is not, again, <laughs> to have me talk, but to motivate you to ask questions. OK? All right, so what is an adaptive intervention? Danny said that, and you saw it in the module. An adaptive intervention is an intervention delivery framework, or an intervention design. It is not an experimental design. And what is the difference between the two? Danny said that, but I want us to make that difference very explicit, OK? An intervention design is the answer to the question, how should practitioners deliver the intervention in practice? What guidelines, what procedures they should follow? That's an intervention design or an intervention delivery framework. So far, so good? So what is an experimental design? An experimental design is the answer to the question, how should we, researchers, now it's about us. How should we systematically manipulate independent variables so we can answer scientific questions that are of interest to us? A SMART is an experimental design. It has randomizations. Why? Because the goal is to answer scientific questions, causal questions, with minimal structural assumptions. The goal is to gather data to answer scientific questions. That's why we have randomizations in a SMART. Do we have randomizations in an adaptive intervention? No, we don't. Because it's not an experimental design. It's an intervention delivery framework, an intervention design. And think about it. When you give someone a protocol, a guide, for how to do something, do you randomize? You don't randomize, right? So no randomizations in adaptive interventions, OK? It's just a guide for how practitioners should deliver treatment. But it's a special guide. Why is it special? Because it's a guide for how practitioners should adapt interventions in practice. And what does it mean, adapt? It means use dynamic information about the person to decide whether and how to intervene. That's what we mean by adapt. But it's not all that we mean by adapt. There are two key things to keep in mind about the term adaptive, OK? For an intervention to be considered adaptive, it has to be protocolized and evidence-based. If it's not protocolized and evidence-based, we don't call it an adaptive intervention. And this go back, goes back to your question earlier. Is what we're doing here an intervention? What I'm doing here is an intervention, but it's not an adaptive intervention. And some of you might be thinking, wait, 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 why? She's standing here, right? She's looking at our responses. And depending on how we respond to what she's saying, she would do something, right? So if you seem bored, I would change my tone of voice, uh, switch to a different slide, or dance, or sing, which nobody wants. But I would do something. I would use dynamic information about your responses to change my behavior. So some of you might be thinking, well, she's using an adaptive intervention, similar to a teacher who adapts their behavior in the classroom as things evolve, right? Or just having a conversation with someone. But this is not an adaptive intervention. It's not because, first of all, can you replicate 
the way I adapt my behavior. Can you go someplace else and teach exactly the same way I do? You can't, right? Because I didn't give you a protocol that specify exactly how I adapt my behavior based on your responses. You don't know what kind of information I'm using, what types of intervention options I'm considering when I adapt my behavior, right? You don't know that. So it's not protocolized, you can't replicate it. Here's another thing. Is it evidence-based? Do you know that the way I adapt my behavior is effective? No, you don't. Maybe it's not effective. You tell me after three days. But maybe it's not. I'm not going to recommend it because I don't know. I don't have evidence indicating that it's the right way to go. But the adaptive interventions that we're going to talk about today, they're supposed to guide public health policy, clinical treatment, academic decision making. These interventions have to include adaptation that is well protocolized so it can be replicated and it has to be effective. Does that make sense? All right. The components. Yeah. I have a question about evidence-based mm -hmm. and what that means. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. And I think that, you know, it goes back to the session that Danny had before. There are all kinds of evidence that we need to gather in the process of building an effective and implementable, bless you, adaptive intervention. We have to go through a preparation phase where we have to figure out what is the scientific model that we can rely on. And then we need to go through a pilot phase where we make sure that whatever we're trying to design, the study and the intervention, bless you, are feasible and acceptable. Then we have to go through an optimization phase where we need to make sure that all the components are working well together, that we selected the right components, we integrated them well, and then we need to go ahead and evaluate the effectiveness of our intervention relative to a suitable control, right? So there's, there are many stages along the process. By the way, highly recommended. Um, Linda <coughs> Collins has a framework, it's called the MOCS, the most, the multi-phase optimization strategy. Where's Kate? Hello, Kate. Kate is also a leader in this area. And it's really nice, there's a book that Linda wrote in 2018 that describes the process of optimizing interventions, including adaptive interventions, and what kind of evidence do you need to gather along the way in order to get to a point where you have an intervention that is empirically based, effective, and resource efficient, right? All right, components of an adaptive intervention. I know you're already familiar with this. Let's go over this really quickly. This is based on uh, Bill Pelham's work, and let me say something really quickly about Bill Pelham. So um, for many years when we did this training, Bill used to come here and spend three or four days with us. He used to sit in the back of the room. And he just liked spending time with us and have conversations. And last year, um, my husband and I took him to dinner. And it was one of those crazy nights. It was, really, it was stormy, it was rainy, it was really dark. And then I drove him back to the hotel. Um, it was an awful drive, and you know he kept complaining about my driving, him and my husband. But yeah, at some point along the way, I asked him, what keeps you going? Why do you do what you do, right? I mean, at this point, you can just retire, and you still come here, and you spend time with us, you know? Why do you do that? And he said, mentorship. It's about making sure that we provide opportunities for early career investigators to thrive in this area and get them to understand the importance of looking at children not as one size fits all, but with specific needs and different desires and looking at children as part of the family and as part of the school. So, I wanted to say this to Andrew Bill because uh, he was the first person to actually give me an opportunity to analyze data from a SMART. And then he said this was the first SMART that was funded by IES. And it was super novel, but it was generous enough to let a novice postdoc get access to a very rich data set and very new data set. And he did not ask for anything in return. And that's in the spirit of what he said in the car. 
It's about the mentorship, it's about providing opportunities. So what I want us to remember in this workshop is that now some of us are early career investigators and we're just starting to collect our data and just thinking about building our research program, but you're all gonna be Bill Callahan's at some point. With rich and thriving programs, let's keep that in mind. Let's keep mentorship in mind, let's keep sharing in mind, giving back to the community. So with that in mind, the components of an adaptive intervention, this is for children with ADHD. This adaptive intervention recommends that the practitioner should start with a low dose of medication, then assess the child's response status throughout the school year, starting at week eight. We need to assess response status monthly. If the child shows early signs of non-response, as soon as they show early signs of non-response, we transition them to the next phase where they receive an augmentation with a behavioral intervention. Otherwise, they continue with the same initial intervention. All right, so what are the components? The first component, decision points. These are points in time in which we need to make treatment decisions. When do we make decisions here? You tell me. When do we make decisions? Come on. Beginning of the school year monthly. Thank you, and then monthly. Hallelujah. Beginning of the school year and monthly. These are the points in time in which we need to make decisions. We now we're all practitioners, okay? This is the protocol that we follow. Second element, the tailoring variables. A tailoring variable is information about the participant that we use to make treatment decisions. And here, we use information about the person's response status, the child's response status. Response status is the tailoring variable, but it's measured with two pieces of information, the individualized list of target behaviors and the impairment rating scale. If the child score on the individualized list of target behaviors was less than 75% and one domain was flagged, was identified in the impairment rating scale, they were classified as non-responders and transitioned to the second phase, all right? So notice that, that this is highly protocolized. We're not just saying, oh, if the child is a responder, then do this, and if they're not a responder, do that. We need to state explicitly how do we, we practitioners, how should practitioners measure response status? And what is the cut point that they should use to determine who's responding and who's not responding, okay? Otherwise, they can't make decisions. All right, talking about cut points, the third element are the thresholds or the levels of the tailoring variable that differentiate between conditions in which we need to do one thing versus another. Here, it's response status, yes or no but there's an underlying cut point. Well, cut points for both individualized list of target behaviors and impairment rating scale, right? The measurements that we're using to decide who's responding and who's not responding. The fourth element, the intervention options. These are different types of treatments, different intensities, different dosages. Um, but I think that mainly in adaptive interventions, these usually correspond to different tactics. <coughs> not specific treatments, okay? And here you see there are two tactics, either continue or augment with a behavioral intervention. All right, when we say adaptation, that's what we mean. All this, it's the adaptation process, okay? It's a process of using dynamic information about the person to decide whether and how to intervene. It includes the tailoring variables, because we need to collect information about the tailoring variables. It includes the thresholds or the levels of the tailoring variables that we use to make intervention decisions, and it includes the intervention options because we need to deliver the recommended intervention options. We means practitioners, okay? Right now, I'm not a scientist, I'm a practitioner. All right, and this adaptation process is guided by decision points. Sorry, it's triggered by decision points, yeah. I just want to clarify, so when you say response status, mm -hmm. you're using it as a catch-all term that actually means it's a very complex measure, well, in this case, from two scales, mm -hmm. but as we go through these next three days, when you say response status, it's a generic term to mean tailoring on some complex measure. Can you maybe explain a little more about why we call it response status? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be response status, by the way. It can be something else. It can be engagement right? Engagers versus non-engagers. Um, 
at the end of the day, it comes down to intermediate assessments of progress that you use that you, the practitioner, needs to use in order to decide what to do next. That's what it means. And you can call it in various ways. Usually, we use the term response status. Sometimes we can't use response. We, can, we, need, to, we need to use the term, Connie, this is you, right? Slow responders, right? Not non-responders, so it depends on the field and the science. Does it answer your question, or are you looking for something else? But, it's, but I agree with you, and that's what I was trying to get at. There's response status, that's the tailoring variable, but then the measurement of the tailoring variable, that's another issue. There is an underlying protocol for how do you need to measure it and what cut points of the measurements that you're using you have to use to differentiate between responders, non-responders, engagers, non-engagers, slow responders, fast responders. Does that make sense? Makes sense. I just wanted to clarify when we mean response status, it's also contextual on provided low dose medication or studying children with ADHD, that that measure can change depending on the needs. Yeah, it changes based on many, many things. It changes based on, um, and I'll show an example very soon, where you can have a different tailoring variable, different measure that you're using, depending on the initial intervention. And the initial intervention depends on baseline characteristics about the participant. It can be based on the problem that you're targeting, the population that you're focusing on. Yeah, totally. I'll show an example really soon. Yeah. Okay. So the adaptation process is triggered at decision points and it is guided by the need to achieve two types of outcomes. There's a distal outcome, the ultimate goal your intervention is intended to achieve. Here it's reducing classroom rule, rule violations by the end of the school year. But the adaptation process is also guided by the need to achieve proximal outcomes, which are the short term goal the intervention is intended to achieve, the adaptation is intended to achieve. Here, it's reducing behavioral difficulties and impairment during the school year. Okay, so think about what's going on here. If the child is not responsive, if they're showing signs of behavioral difficulties and impairment, we give them more support, why? Because we want to reduce behavioral difficulties and impairment throughout the school year. Why do we wanna do that? in order to achieve the distal outcome reduction in classroom rule violations by the end of the school year. So your proximal outcomes are like mediators, mechanisms of change, through which the adaptation can help achieve the distal outcome. Does that make sense? All right, so now we're gonna go to Kahoot. What I want you to do is use your phones to go to kahoot.it. Your phone's not the computer, it's much better. Ian's going to give you a pin to type. And you're going to be asked to use a nickname. Please use a nickname. Don't use your real name. And then we can start playing. Okay, I'm gonna wait for everybody to join. It's so funny that since, since there's so many education scientists here, you guys actually know how to use Kahoot. <laughs> <laughs> when we do this with other communities, they have, they're like, what? Kahoot? Oh, what? You know? <laughs> it's great. <Yeah. laughs> Okay, I have 10 questions and, and obviously answers. <laughs> but these uh, questions and answers, I actually took most of it from a paper that Danny and Connie wrote in 2018. And it's in, your mo it's in, the, in the slides. We're going to share the slides with you. I think all the slides are already online, right, Ian? Yes. Yeah, they are? Okay, so there's a, um, there's a reference in the last slide 
for this specific paper. Okay, I have 31, so it looks like everyone's here. Am I missing anybody? We're good? Okay, let's start. Oh. Ian, do we have a mouse connected here? Because it doesn't want to. Hmm. Oh, just uh, press harder, I guess. Harder? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> For someone who does research on technology, I'm obviously not so good at this. <laughs> All right. First question. Must an adaptive intervention recommend a single intervention component at each decision point? Yes, no, or it depends. Must an adaptive intervention recommend a single intervention component at each decision point? Notice the must. Must. What do you think? Oh, okay, awesome job. Yes, the answer is no. Yes, the answer is no. It's terrible. Okay. So, oh, I got it. All right. Hell, hello world. Hello world. Who's hello world? Hello? Why hello world? <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. All right. That's interesting. All right. Okay. So, why no? It's because of the word must, okay? An adaptive intervention does not have to recommend a, sin a single intervention component at each decision point. It can, of course, it can. But in many cases, an adaptive intervention recommends a set of components. For example, look here. Here, we start with a low dose of medication. If the child is not responding, the practitioner has two options they can choose from. Behavioral intervention or increasing the dose of the medication. So we're not recommending a single component. We're recommending, we can recommend a set of components if it makes sense to recommend a set of components. Question for you, since you're not asking me questions. Can you think about a situation where I am a scientist, not a practitioner, and I design an intervention, an adaptive intervention like this one, where at the second stage I recommend that the practitioner would use, would choose between two intervention options, two tactics. When could that happen for me as a scientist to design a second stage option like this one that includes a selection, that recommends a selection between two components? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, when I think that the child's preference can play a very important role. Yes. What else should happen here? Yeah. I mean, in real practice, that might be what they recommend either more medication or should I go to an alternative to be able to in addition to medication. Mm -hmm. If I know, for example, that this is something that I have to include as an option because of all kinds of reasons, but I also want the clinician to consider this option as well, if it makes sense. What else? Think about me as a scientist. I'm telling the clinician that here in the second stage, you can choose between two options. As a scientist, what do I need to know when I recommend something like this? Yeah. Over here, someone wanted to say something? I was going to mention the real practical aspect of this we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. If we work in small rural areas, for instance, sometimes behavioral intervention is even possible because of resources. Mm -hmm. One of the options that we might be effective as a scientist might be just to increase the medication. Mm -hmm. Is that practical? practical yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think 
most importantly, if as a scientist I think that there is no difference between the two, right? I think that both options can be important for practical reasons, right? Also here in terms of preferences. And also for scientific reasons, I have evidence indicating that they're both good. So it makes sense for me to suggest both of them and have the clinician decide what to do based on child and family preferences, based on the resources that are available in practice, right? And as a scientist, I would want to have some evidence indicating that both are effective because I'm not going to recommend this if this is not effective. If I don't have evidence indicating that this is a good option, subsequent option, I'm not going to include it in the set, right? All right. Ready for the next question? Can tailoring variables differ based on previous intervention? Maybe, yes, no. Can tailoring variables differ based on previous intervention? What do you think? Oh, nice. Okay. Indeed, the answer, the correct answer here is yes. And let's see. Okay. Hello, world. And we also have second place for Adwell. Adwell? What's Adwell? Adwell is the shorthand name for my K research study. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> that's nice. That's really nice. Oh, and who's, who's Pip? Here. What's PIP? Uh, <laughs> it's from um, Great Expectations Character. Nice. Yeah. Now we know what people like. <laughs> Their K Award TV series. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean it in that way. Okay. So can tailoring variables differ based on previous interventions? Of course, of course it's possible, you see? And this relates to what I said earlier in response to Mason. You see, this is an example, it's very interesting, where we use a different tailoring variable depending on the initial intervention that kids received. But the initial intervention that kids received also varies depending on their symptom severity, okay? So for children with severe ADHD, at the beginning, what do we want to do? We want to improve their symptoms. That's the most immediate thing that we need to target. And that's why we start with a low dose of medication. And we use information about symptom reduction to decide what to do next. Because that's what we're trying to do, achieve symptom reduction, immediate relief. But for children with less severe ADHD, we can focus on behavioral issues, right? So we start with the behavioral intervention and then we use information about improvement in the target behavior to decide what to do next. You see, we're using different tailoring variables for different initial intervention options for different kids based on the severity of their ADHD problems or baseline. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense, but the nice thing about this example, this is something that Danny highlighted two years ago and it took me a while to see, is how this example clarifies the connection between the tailoring variable and the proximal outcome. There's a connection between them. I want to show you, okay? You ready? For kids with severe ADHD, the proximal outcome, the thing that I'm trying to change, is the severity of their symptoms. I'm trying to help them manage the symptoms. That's the thing. That's my proximal outcome. And I want to help them with the symptoms throughout the school year. That's why I start with a low dose of medication to lead to immediate improvement. And that's why I'm using information about symptom reduction as a tailoring variable in order to be able to alleviate their symptoms subsequently throughout the school year. So in many cases, the tailoring variable is the proximal outcome measured at earlier time points. That's what's happening here. And same thing here. Here what we're trying to do is we're going, we want to, as a proximal outcome, 
help them improve their behaviors throughout the school year. That's why we start with the behavioral intervention, and that's why we use information at week eight about improvement in the target behaviors to decide how to move forward because we want to improve the target behaviors in the course of the school year as the proximal. <coughs> yes? Um, so I have a question that's kind of been in the back of my mind since uh, earlier this morning. We're thinking about community engaged research. If we have a child who's severe ADHD spectrum disorder, and they're getting the therapy, and then they get to the school and they're like, oh, yeah, I just want to go to school. Like, I don't want to be on medication anymore. Mm -hmm. So we have the best intent of continuing on our research or agenda to yeah. continue what we do we then start a third group based on our community informed um community informed needs mm -hmm. so we're essentially changing what we initially proposed rightfully so i think but how, how does that kind of fit in with potentially grant funding and high yes. essence changing our trajectory especially in, in many ways you can do that you can add a third group but another thing that you can do, which I think we highly recommend, is to engage your community right off the bat when you design the, well, when you come up with the scientific questions, when you lay out the initial intervention model that you have in mind. You have to work with your community. And if there is a treatment option that does not work for this community, there's no way they're going to adopt it. I wouldn't use it. Or I would design strategies around them to get the communities buy-in for that. Right? So there's a lot of ways that you can approach this, but my recommendation is to start working with the community right off the bat, from the initial phases of developing your intervention model. Does that make sense? Of course, yeah. Billy, can I chime in here? Because mm -hmm. I, I love the question. Uh, essentially, what you're saying is this adaptive intervention, by the way, this whole screen is one adaptive intervention. I want to make sure it doesn't miss the page. We've got all the kids here. There's four pathways. What you're saying essentially is that this adaptive intervention is not feasible because in the world you envisioned in step one, you had to make allowances for a parent to say a tailoring variable that is, I want out. Therefore, as an intervention developer, you have to do one of two things or both. Double down and try to re-engage them. Okay, I know you want out, but, and or have the next intervention ready. What you just said, Megan, is beautiful, is this intervention is not feasible. But, and I want y'all to realize that that means that we, you, you didn't do step one. You didn't think about the implementation of this thing. So it's not like that this is a researcher thing and then when the researcher thing hits the real world, it's not feasible. No, 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 no. We made a mistake. We did not include parents wanting out in the intervention. We don't live in a world where we're putting down their throats. The people in the real world, we're like these kings, and we're putting down their throats. That, no, that's what's getting us into a pigness. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it also means that you did not involve your parents when you designed this intervention, and that's the key. And this is where I think in many cases we get science wrong, right? Yeah, I think that, that it's kind of the, um, the, the cycle of research, mm -hmm. right? Time, you know, for four years. Yeah. You cannot have a pure community engaged relationship in four years' time. Yeah. And then based on the, so really it's the, yeah, so it's, it's, the, it's the kind of the circular process. I agree. <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah. There were other questions here? Yeah. I was just going to suggest that instead of, like, if we say the adaptive intervention space, instead of thinking about the third arm, you might think about that as a tailoring period. Yeah. Yeah, that's what Danny suggested. Yeah. There are various ways that you can go about this. In some cases, it would make sense to have a tailoring variable. In some cases, it would make sense to have a third arm. In some cases, it would make sense not to propose this intervention at all. Yeah. 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 Um, I have a question. So, one of the things that I'm curious about when you're trying to create an intervention and tailor, you're thinking about the tailoring variables. Evidence base is one of the criteria, right? So if you're dealing in a, if you're working with a community that you really don't have much evidence based practice mm -hmm. to be able to substantiate a tarot like term variable, what are your suggestions for that? Hmm. 
So tell me more. Give me an example. Right. So if we're, for, for instance, uh, BIPOC communities, um, in particular, you're maybe autism research. So if we're looking at trying to come up with information, for example, community based, and the community is making these suggestions for this is, these are things that we think will really make a difference. Mm -hmm. But there's not much evidence to. Uh, to me, that's what you're to me that's evidence. To me, when you go to the community, and the community says, "Look." I want to have a choice in whether I get medication or I get the behavioral intervention. Then you have a good lead for a tailoring variable. Parent choice, right? It's a really, really good starting point. And sometimes that's all you got. These are practical considerations that go into the design of your tailoring variable. Elizabeth, this all happens with you in the preparation. Yeah. And so, like, for example, in, your, in the community you're working in, if you already know no one in this community is going to do this or this, this is out of the question. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? So you, the things you know, you build in to your intervention. That's yeah. where, that's the part of the preparation phase, you understanding all that. And some tailoring variables don't need evidence, right? So I was part of a research where it was clear that if um, um, the child does not use a particular technology, you cannot give him that specific mobile-based intervention. Or we know that if the child does not have a supportive family, we cannot give him a component that builds on family support. Right? You don't need to collect evidence. You have enough practical considerations to justify something like that. Yeah, there was another question here? Yeah. Well, we're going back to what Danny had just said, of, they're calling it preparation in this course, but like the intervention development, there are phases before you get to like the pilot study mm -hmm. of looking at like what are your outcomes, like looking at outcomes in your population. I think those are really good to consider. Uh, and so I'll just think about like this intervention specifically is like what can this intervention look like even before you get to this thought process. Yeah, I kind of wish someone would break the preparation phase into a few um, phases. You know what I'm trying to say? Because um, going back at you and I had multiple discussions about this. There's the phase where you need to come up with your scientific model and you have to engage the community in figuring out what is the scientific model? Like what are the mechanisms of change? What is the problem that you can and cannot target? Right? What is the ultimate goal you're trying to achieve? What are the moderators? What's missing? What would the intervention look like in the ideal setting? Right? And then, of course, there are some questions that you have, and you can have a pilot study, you know, where the goal is to test the feasibility and acceptability of different intervention options and trial procedures. Right? So even the preparation phase in itself, I think we need to think about this as you know, something that is more segmented as opposed to, oh, it's this black box. Yeah. All right. We need to move to the next question. By the way, if we don't get through all of them, that's fine. I prefer to have a discussion as opposed to uh, have a good leaderboard. All right. Is it the case that adapting interventions seek to replace clinical judgment? Yes. No. Sometimes. Yeah. I need to change these answers. It's awful. <laughs> By the way, we're using clinical judgment here. You know, I just don't know. We don't know how to say educational judgment. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's true. That as a Is it the case that adaptive interventions seek to replace clinical judgment? Yeah, the answer is no. We're not trying to replace clinical judgment. What are we trying to do? We're trying to guide clinical and academic decision making. That's what we're trying to do. We're not trying to replace it. And going back to the previous example, sometimes our goal is to provide options. Our investigators who build interventions, we're trying to provide options that clinicians, educators consider when they need to decide what to do. Does that make sense? All right. Next. Is it the case that adapting interventions are non-standard because they involve randomization? Not sure. No or yes?
It's a tricky question. Yeah. Okay. Most of you got it right. It is a tricky question. It's how we framed it that is kind of tricky. So, yeah, the answer is no. Adaptive interventions, it's not that they're non-standard because they involve randomizations. We already know. No randomizations in adaptive intervention. But they are non-standard. They're non-standard because it's a transition from a one-size-fits-all approach to treatment to a setting where our goal is to address not only the unique but also the changing needs of people as they progress over time. Okay, going back to the legacy of Bill Pelham, we can treat children and their families as one size fits all. They have different needs and their needs change over time. All right. How do I address missing data in an adaptive intervention? This is a really important question. How do I address missing data in an adaptive intervention? So think about it. who's I? Who's I? Okay. With multiple imputation, removing missing observations, missing data does not exist in adaptive intervention or account for this in the intervention design. How do I address missing data in an adaptive intervention? It's a tricky question. All right. Most of you got it right. Account for this in the intervention design. So I think we need to reframe this question, okay? So who is I? I, let's assume that I, I'm the researcher. The question is, how do I design an adaptive intervention in such a way that practitioners will know what to do if information about the tailoring variable is missing, right? I'm the researcher, I'm designing an adaptive intervention for a practitioner to use. I need to guide them what to do if they don't have information about the tailoring variable, right? So what I need to do is design the adaptive intervention in such a way that they will know what to do when data is missing. And this can be done by integrating missing data as a tailoring variable in the intervention. You see what's happening here? I'm starting for children with severe ADHD with a low dose of medication. And then if there's no information about the tailoring variable symptom reduction, I augment with the behavioral intervention. I recommend that the practitioner will augment with a behavioral intervention. Otherwise, if there is information about the tailoring variable, the practitioner should use this information to decide what to do next. You see that? I'm telling them what to do if data is missing. And this is really, really critical. And this yeah, relates. And we've had a lot of clinicians and researchers doing their KORs or whatever on adaptive interventions. And they're like, Danny, they didn't tell me what, I, I didn't know if they were responders or not. And I'm like, well, what was your plan? Mm -hmm. You need to have a plan. That's, that's part of the intervention. <laughs> and speaking of a plan, how do I address non adherence in an adaptive intervention? This relates to one of the questions that you had before. Non-adherence is not a problem via the intervention design by collecting and analyzing data and with multiple imputation. You should know this exactly with the intervention design. Exactly in the same way that we need to have a plan for what to do when data is missing, we can make a plan for what the practitioner should do if adherence is suboptimal. Here's an example where we integrate adherence as a tailoring variable. You see? Here, if adherence is low, we recommend to augment with a behavioral intervention. If adherence is sufficient, this is when we use, we recommend using information about symptom reduction to decide how to move forward. Does that make sense? We use information about adherence, yeah. Would you ever combine the last slide if you don't have information, like the missing data? Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. You guys will be surprised how many times Lily and I have read intervention manuals that there's not a single section on what the practitioner is going to do if someone doesn't show up to, to treatment, which is mind boggling. Okay, I'm going to skip 
a few questions here because I want us to talk about a question that is really, really important. And this is going to be our last one. Actually, let's do this one too. The proximal outcome must be measured in an adaptive intervention. We're going to do this quickly because it's really important. The proximal outcome must be measured in an adaptive intervention. Yes, no, it depends on the scientific question. It depends on the distal outcome. Think about it. Does the practitioner need to measure the proximal outcome? So this is interesting. The correct answer here is no. Bless you. Who's Dela Cowboy? Dela Cowboy? Are you shy? Dela Cowboy? I like that. Okay, I'm not going to put you on the spot. I'm not going to put you on the spot. Let's move forward. Okay, everybody know the practitioner does not need to measure the proximal outcome or the distal outcome. When they use an adaptive intervention in practice, when a practitioner employs an adaptive intervention in practice, all they need to measure is the tailoring variable. That's all they need to know. It's true, I said that earlier, sometimes the tailoring variable is the proximal outcome measured at earlier time points. Sometimes it's the distal outcome measured at earlier time points. But you're not going to measure this information because it's the proximal outcome or the distal outcome at earlier time points. You measure this, you the practitioner, you measure this because it's the tailoring variable. It's the information that you need to make decisions. Without this, can you make decisions? No. Okay? All right. Now, we're really going to go to the last question. Now it's the real last question, I promise. Let me skip this one. Okay. Ready. We don't have to worry about intervention engagement when planning an adaptive intervention. True? False? Only when intervention engagement is a proximal outcome, only when intervention engagement is a tailoring variable. We don't have to worry about intervention engagement when planning an adaptive intervention. What do you think? Oh, you got this right. This is false. This is completely false. Okay. On the one hand, in, adap in adaptive interventions, because we are addressing the needs of people who are not doing well, there's potential here for increasing engagement. Because think about it. In a standard intervention where you're just giving people just one intervention, everybody gets the same thing. And if they're not responding, you're not doing anything about this, right? there are more chances, chances that people will disengage, will just drop out of the intervention. Okay, I'm not talking about research, just the intervention, all right? But because we are identifying people who are not doing so well, we're doing something about it, and people know about this right from the get-go, then this has the potential to increase their engagement in the intervention overall. But the adaptation can also undermine engagement. And to see this, I want you to think about a child and the parents. They started this intervention with a little dose of medication. They really wanted the medication. They had high hopes for this. You know, the child is really struggling. But then the child is not responsive at week eight. Now the practitioner says, okay, let's transition you to a behavioral intervention. This is more intense. This is more burdensome. The child is demoralized. The parents are anxious. They're not going to do this. They're going to drop out of the intervention, right? So the adaptation can actually undermine engagement. But what do you do about this? There's many, many, many things that you should do about this. 
You should plan for this as you design the intervention. Now I'm talking about you, the investigator. When you design an adaptive intervention for practitioners, you have to plan in such a way that you would increase sustained engagement in the course of the intervention. You got to get the parents and the child's buy-in right off the bat to tell them, look, we're going to start with the medication, but you should know sometimes it doesn't work. For some people, it doesn't work, but it doesn't mean that we're going to leave you alone. It means that we're going to try out something different, and we know that the subsequent treatment might be intense, but you should know that it actually works. There's evidence that you know, this can make a huge dif difference for you, right? You need to get their buy-in right off the bat. And then you need to manage this transition to make sure that they don't disappear on you as soon as you transition them to the second phase. You need to explain why you're transitioning them. You have to bring them back. Does that make sense? Get their buy-in. You need to plan for engaging participants in the intervention. Not assume that the adaptation will just solve everything. Does that make sense? All right, and with that, I'm done with my session. But let's see who won the game. Hold on. Oh. Be nice. The cowboy is number one. I bet it's the cowboy. Yay! OK, so the daylight cowboy doesn't want to show his face but or their face. Uh, who's be nice? Be nice. And who's Pod? Hey, Pod. Why Pod? I knew I was going to get asked that. Uh, it will take a while. <laughs> okay, so during the break, we all go to you, Pod, and you need to explain to us why Pod. All right, let's clap it up for everybody. Thank you.